the point guard, arguably the most important position on the basketball court. And as the game has evolved, so too has the point guard. And somewhere in this evolution, the game created a lane where two point guards could coexist in the same backcourt at the same time. And in the CIAA, you won't find a point guard duo better than Robert Davis and Christian Kirchman of Johnson C. Smith University. My name is Christian Kirchman. I'm a point guard here at Smith, and I'm from Long Island, Virginia. My name is Robert Davis, a uh, shooting guard here at Johnson C. Smith University. I'm from West Virginia, Maryland. I guess when he first actually came, he came on a visit, and um, he was actually killing everybody. So we knew we wanted him to come. I was killing him over there, so I did. But I seen him too. He was he was nice too. Really, what stick out with me is I see he could really score the ball. But he was a point guard here, and when I came in, I was shooting guard. So I, I didn't. I never knew that we was gonna really switch positions, but I'm cool with it. We both accepted it. I feel like, like it was just it was a smooth transition. It was easy because, like I said, we feed off each other. It was never no jealousy or no nothing. It was like I want to see you eat, you want to see me eat, so let's just eat together. It was like a bond. It was it was real simple. It was a real smooth transition. Yeah, we work we work hard together. Like it's like a uh, like it's my brother. So every day we were in the gym together. Um, after the gym, we go eat, come back to the gym for practice. We listen to coach and what he says. Um, but I feel like we do feed off each other, and that's, like, that's what makes it look. Really, like, that's my brother off the court, and he's gonna be my brother for life, man. So we in the grade. Now, this is no rarity in CIAA hoops. In fact, some of the greatest guards in the history of the CI were just one half of amazing guard duos Pee Wee Kirkland and Hookshot Grant of Norfolk State, Earl the Pearl Monroe and Ted Blunt from Winston Salem State, and Mark Sherrill and Columbus Parker from Johnson C. Smith University. And it shouldn't be at all surprising that the very same Mark Sherrill, now an assistant coach at JCSU, along with their head coach Steven Joyner, a star point guard at Smith himself back in the day, have used their own experiences in the backcourt to help mold the Davis Kirchman duo. Coach Sherrill recruited me, he heard about me and came to cover my uh, junior college games. I was really just hungry, man. I was player of the year, I was all American. And then when Smith rolled around, they showed me love, and then they brought me here, told me what they wanted me to do when I came in. And you know, I like Coach John. I had heard a lot about him, heard a lot about Coach Earl. And then once I came to the games, they were just so crazy. I said, man, I got to come here. And then it's in this great city of Charlotte. So. My past year was actually, um, Coach Earl came to one of my games, uh, high school. I think it was like a little tournament kind of. I reached out to him first, I think, and then he reached out to me more and sent him my tapes, and then we built a relationship off that. Oh, Jordan, man. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know he's serious. You know he always going to be serious. <laughs> Sometimes he'll throw a couple jokes in there. Uh, I mean, he's fun to play for. Man, Coach Jordan, I, I never <laughs> met nobody like Coach Jordan, man. And yeah. everybody knows him, too. So. Everybody knows him. <laughs> but honestly, man, I look at Coach Jordan more than the coach. I really look at him like a father figure, yeah. too. You know what I'm saying? Because the stuff he says to him, the stuff he does to him, like, he really just, he makes me better on the court and really off the court as a person, too. You know? At the end of the day, man, I wouldn't want to play for no other coach. And you can't just take any two point guards, throw them out there on the court and expect success. And for Robert Davis and Christian Kirchman, they've created a specific formula that combines intense competition and practice with egoless play during the game. We, we both know we two good guards, dominant guards. Like you said, we both can score, both can pass. But at the end of the day, if he's doing good and I'm doing good, we'll win. You know, if, if one of us is having an off night, that's one thing I can say. Like, if I'm having an off night or something, he'll pick up for the slack. Or if he's having an off night, I'll pick up for the slack. So it's really just, man, it's just a good, it's just a good thing for me. And I think it really came from off the court. Really, because we go tight off the court. Like you said, we work hard every day in the gym, just me and him getting up shots or whether we grinding, lifting weights. So really, we just want to see each other do good. Man. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, so. building chemistry. I think uh, practice, um, just in the gym, uh, shooting by ourselves. Um, I think that's where it comes from. That's where, um, that's where like our grind comes from. That's where, like, that's why we want it so bad. Like we, we work for it. And, uh, I think that's what builds our relationship with builds. And, and don't confidence. get it twisted though, we real competitive, man. Yeah, yeah, he, he competitive with each other, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 one-on-one shooting games, all that. You can't beat me in nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't let them fool you out here, man. Usually at the beginning of practice, the guards, we do our own thing, like four and four, five and five, and I'm never on his team, I always check him. You know, he check me, just to make each other better. Even when we by ourselves, even in the pickup, yeah. we'll play against each other. Sometimes we play on the same team, but like, I want to go against him, because I know it's going to get me better. Mm -hmm. The same way, I know if I guard him, it's going to get me better. So that's, we real competitive with each other. We don't take it easy on each other. I don't think he do nothing better. <laughs> it's like, nah, he can, he can pass better than me. I'm not going to lie. He can, he can pass better than me. 
I give it to him, man. <laughs> I, 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 I give it to him, man. He can, he can feed that ball a little bit. Man. I feed off him, he feed off me, really, man. Like, on the court, I know he can shoot the ball real good, so I like to get it to him where he likes it. You know, he likes to shoot in rhythm, transition three. You know, he likes to run the floor, really, so he makes my job easy. So I just feed off him, and then when he scores, like, it turns me up to feel more too. But I'm just, I'm the one who like to get everybody involved and like to just, I feed off him. Yeah, same thing he said. Uh, I feel like we feed off each other uh, the most. And if I'm going or he's going, then it gets, it gets, it gets one of us going at the same time. The majority of the time, if he's getting it, I'm, I'm just filling in the lane. But like you say, I can run the two just like he run the two. And he can run the one because he's been point guard. He was point guard here for two years. I was point guard here for a year. So, yeah, and we, and we know the system like the back of our hand. So it don't matter what, what position we're at. So we know where to go, what to do. And, Whoever had it, whoever got it, when they get the rebound, you know the goal. And the results of sticking to that formula is Robert Davis leading the conference in points per game and Christian Kirchman leading the conference in assists per game. And they're both leading the Golden Bulls to first place in the CIAA Southern Division behind a nine game winning streak. And it definitely feels good to know that the hard work is paying off. We know that we can't, we can't stop working hard and, and that we got to keep working so that we can stay on top and so that we can win a set of the championship. That's the main goal. Yeah, that, that's really the main goal. I mean, it does feel good, though, honestly, you know, to, to lead, like you say, in assists and points. It does really feel good. But like you said, to know that the hard work and stuff is paying off and people are actually noticing it, that's, that's, that's really what makes it feel better. I feel like when we stay together um, as a team and, and we all work hard and, and do what Coach says, um, I feel like that's what's gonna get us the best chance to get into the special center and win the Seattle. Yeah, really like I just feel like we just need everyone to buy in. Like cause we got a good group this year, man. We got a real good group. Like if we come to play how we know we can play, there's no telling what we can do with this team, man. But like you said, buying in, really just listening to coach. And like you said, we playing for a legendary coach. Really just listening to him, buying in and working hard, man. You can't cheat the grind. If everybody grind hard, practice hard, at the end of the day, the results will show it. And heading into the 2018 CIAA tournament, this exciting guard duo knows that they're playing in the footsteps of giants, as well as creating their own footprint for the next generation of exciting guards in the CIAA. It's exciting to know that Coach Cheryl and Ankles joined the play in the CIAA, to know that we can carry on that legacy and, and uh, be a part of it is it's amazing. Yeah, really, it's really an honor, man. With all the uh, great names that came through the CIAA, all the great players, Hope people made it to the uh, NBA, you know. It's like a big family, man. So it's, it's really just an honor, man. I love it, man. When tournament time coming around, you know, it's time to stay focused on the court. It's hard, like, you gotta put the distractions away and all that other stuff, focus on basketball. It's really the main thing, really. But it's an honor to play in the CI, man, to be a part of the team, man. Really is. on the next episode of The Players Club. Hey, I'm Quincy January, senior from St. Augustus University, Power Ford, sport manager major from Riverdale, Georgia. Playing in the CIAA, I couldn't be more thankful for it. I thank God every day for just allowing me to have this opportunity to be able to actually play college basketball because not many people can say that they actually play college basketball. It'll be all nice, you know, to say like, yeah, I played the CIAA and I did this, I did that. But one thing that I'm for sure going to say is that we want to see our championship. That's my main focus. So that's the one thing that I can always carry over with me because they can't take that away from me. Four years. In the game of college hoops, you only have four years to leave a legacy that can last a lifetime. And for St. Augustine University senior Quincy January, 
The 2018 CIAA tournament serves as his final chance to add to his already impressive legacy as a St. Aug Falcon. A legacy that started with one block shot in a church league in Riverdale, Georgia. In fifth grade, when I was playing in uh, church league, it was my first time uh, ever actually playing basketball, and I had blocked this one kid's shot, and I always remember that block shot because it was like for kind of like a buzzer beater for going to the halftime. And I had blocked the shot, and, that, it just, and the crowd was going wild, and it just gave me a, a great sensation. Like, this is this is what I want to do. Transition to high school, that was a big leap. I started varsity right after my freshman year, so it was like jumping right into the fire. So I had to get adjusted with everything, and I was uh, region player of the year, uh, defensive player of the year there, and um, MVP for my school a couple of years. I had some D1 uh, offers, or uh, talking to some D1 coaches and stuff like that, but. Um, it didn't fall through, I guess. They weren't as serious as, as they seemed to be. My AAU coach, Coach Douglas, um, knew a coach that used to coach here, um, Coach Gibbons. And he had me set up to come up here, have a visit and stuff like that. After the visit, you know, I liked the school, I liked what I saw and everything, and I decided to come here. I'm a firm believer in Christ, you know, in God and God's plan. So I feel like this is, this is where I'm supposed to be at. Because uh, actually, after my sophomore year, a couple of D1 coaches wanted me to transfer, but I just, I just told him I was fine here. Of course, you know, I thought I was going to go D1 out of high school, but, you know, everything is not meant for everybody, you know. So I just took um, what I had and I made the best of it. It's actually funny because uh, my coach was talking to me and he was telling me, like, I wasn't even supposed to, to play my freshman year. I was supposed to be a red, he was supposed to red shirt me my freshman year, but he said he couldn't get uh, the bigs that he, and he was trying to recruit. So I ended up coming here and, and starting my freshman year. Uh, so it was, there was a lot of a lot of expectations on me, but um, I think I handled it pretty well. Just you know, keeping calm and and doing what he asked of me, and just performing the best way I can. It was it was I'm not gonna lie, it was a little bit scary. You know, uh, my first college game. You know, very very fast paced, high paced, just going going going. Like it's nothing like high school. So you know, you gotta you have to learn to adapt. You know, uh, my freshman year, I was really is I really established myself because that's where I like was just really catching oops and putbacks and stuff like that. And I was just making myself assertive, you know, making sure people knew who I was, trying to get my name out there. And after a disappointing exit in last year's tournament, you just gotta use it as fire to, you know, not wanna have this feeling again. Quincy January only needs one thing to complete his legacy, a CIAA championship. When the ball doesn't bounce the way you want it to, that's, that's, it's, it's heartbreaking, um, honestly. Last year in the tournament, you know, we were set up in a good position. Uh, played a good team last year at Fayetteville. We made it all the way to the, to the finals, you know. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't execute like we should have, and it, and, it, and it hurt really bad. I felt like that was supposed to be our year. We were supposed to go all the way to the championship, and I just knew that was going to happen. Um, for us to exit out um, as we did, it, it, it hurt a lot, but that hurt, I just carry over to this season, you know, making sure that we don't have to feel that anymore. Um, preparing my guys and myself uh, for the tournament coming up, because um, all of them are new to the tournament. Only three of us have actually been in the tournament, and the rest of the team is all, all new to it, so it's like, and I keep telling them, it's, it's very different. Like, CIAA tournament play is very different than regular season play. So it's like, I just have to make sure that they come ready and make sure I'm gonna prepare them right, so everybody has the right mindset and uh, the will to win. Like I told them last night, um, after the loss, you know, that, that put us in a out of second place race. So now we're, we're uh, fighting to keep third. And being that we play third, we'll be playing Wednesday uh, throughout. So I just telling them, like, you know, it's not impossible. Because before the new format, you know, they had teams playing Tuesday all the way to Saturday. And some, team, some players, uh, teams that won like that, he made it to the championship. So I tell them, like, just because we, we lost this game, yeah, we lost it. But what I'm telling them is that we have to learn from this game because coming up to CIs, we can't make the same mistakes. Because um, in CIs, when you make those mistakes, other teams will capitalize. And we can't give other teams that opportunity to capitalize off our mistakes. If we're, if we're going to be beat, we just have to flat out be beat, not by beating ourselves, but have the other team be a better team than us that night. Playing in the CIAA, I couldn't be more thankful for it. Uh, I thank God every day for just allowing me to have this opportunity to be able to actually play college basketball because not many people can say that they actually play college basketball. It'll be all nice, you know, to say like, yeah, I played CIAA and I did this, I did that. But one thing now for sure going to say is that we won a CIAA championship. That's my main focus. So that's the one thing that I can always carry over with me because they can't take that away from me.
on the next episode of The Players Club. You can't hide your emotions, you know. You know what I'm saying? So everything you try to hide behind during the season, it comes out at the tourney. So if you're a dog, you're gonna be a dog. If you pretend to be a dog, you're gonna show up the biggest cat in that arena. So I'm ready to see what the dogs here. This is Romeo Belfield. I said, yes, sir, who's speaking? This is the manager from Starbucks, man. I heard you're a shoe guard. We need one of those around here. I was like, you gotta be kidding me, man. Yeah, I'm a shoe guard. What you need me to do? Shoot up a coffee? A legend. <laughs> On one hand, a legend is a story. A tale filled with so many unbelievable twists and turns people often question its authenticity. On the other hand, a legend is an individual one whose actions elicit enough respect from their peers that they honor them with legendary status. And for Ramel Pee Wee Belfield, his legend started in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina with a nickname from Mom, a jump shot from Pop, and some hand-me-down game from his brothers who were also legends in their own right. His mother named him Pee Wee, and, and it stuck. There's nothing Pee Wee about him, just his name. His older brother is Mario Garner, and Mario was a standout in high school at Roanoke Rapids High School. But unfortunately, Mario uh, is deceased now. He was a female. And everyone in Runner Rapids knew Mario. He had like a New York swing. He had heart. He had heart on the court. You know, he didn't belly up. The, comp the, the steeper the competition was, the steeper he got. So that's where it stems down to Romeo. Before he died, he was like a different type of brother, you know what I'm saying? If you didn't play ball, he was gonna make you play ball because that's just something that he did. And so, and he won't go let you be just regular at playing basketball. You had to be the, you definitely had to stand out in anything you do. So if you couldn't shoot, you had to play hard defense. But thank God I could shoot just a little more than I could play defense. He wanted his brothers to do well. And I know he's probably looking down from heaven with a smile. Then Rakim took the, took the hams and yeah, he followed him around and he just wanted to be like Rakim, you know, he used to call him Bakim. He said, let me shoot Bakim, let me shoot. When he started playing basketball, I would, I would play with them because I could play myself, but I gained a lot of weight now. I still can shoot. That's where he get the shooting from. He always had an eye for the ball, but as he progressed in the eighth grade, that's when he beat me one-on-one. -on -one. Right then and there is when I knew that this, this guy has the talent. First time I uh, beat my pops, I had blocked this shot. And he kind of got mad, so he wanted to run the game back. And so then I really beat him, and then that's when I guess he was like, oh yeah, it's time for me to stop playing ball. I never seen him like really try to play me one-on-one -on -one no more after that. Oh, in the ninth grade, he was on the junior varsity team, and he was a little skinny fellow. I had told the coach, I said, I said, Pee-wee can shoot. Yeah. So one, one game, Pee-wee bust open and just started shooting, and it never looked back since then. And he always had the heart. And when the uh, sophomore year, and he began to grow taller, and so that's when he learned that he could dunk the basketball. And ever since then, when he started dunking the basketball, he never looked back. When I first dunked in the game, that's when it really took off. That was what, 10th grade, going to my 11th grade year. When I first had got in the newspaper, I didn't know that I was in the newspaper until everybody, when I came out, everybody really thought I was like, they was like, you, you really playing basketball, ain't you? And then they showed me the paper. I was like, oh, this could be something. And then I just ran from there. He played varsity 11th grade year, but during that summer, we put a lot of time in the gym. A lot of time in the gym, so his range got better, his body got stronger, he got faster, and it just came from there. I knew I was gonna be a little, little, little more than just regular, but I didn't want to carry it that way. And then in high school, I was in the band a little bit too. I had to get in the weight room, get a little bigger, and the drums, by me playing the drums in the summer, that helped my muscles expand and stuff too, so that all, played a part in everything that I did. So he was fascinated, he had a lot of dunks. And he was, the, uh, in high school, he was the leading scorer on, on his team. Leading scorer, leading rebounder. And, uh, and at six feet, he used to jump center. 
Being a slam dunking three point specialist who jumped center at six feet tall in high school is always going to attract attention from the next level. And it only took one visit to Northampton West High School for another legend, the late great Edward Buck Joyner, then head coach of St. Paul's College, to see what everyone in Roanoke Rapids already knew. Edward Buck Joyner came to Northampton West High School, him and Coach Dante Travis. Someone had told him, We got this kid down at Northampton West and he can light the nets up. They played Gates County that night when he came to recruit him. He had an outstanding game. In fact, they had 31, and they won. And, and uh, Coach Jordan said he didn't need to see any more. He didn't care what, how you felt or, or, or what was you gonna say. He was gonna say everything he needed to say or he felt that needed to be said at that moment, which I respected on a whole nother level because he's not telling you what you wanted to hear. He's telling you what you need to hear, good or bad and that got me through a lot in life. They gave him an invite, they came to the school to do a workout. And so during that workout, he just displayed more talent of shooting the basketball, and they signed him, and they came to the school and did the letter of intent and everything. And we went into a, a college workout. That's when I had seen my former teammate here die, Eric DeBose, and I had two other guys that came with me and then when I seen him playing, I knew I had a lot of work to do to get better, and which motivated me from here to this day now that I always got some work to do from that day of me first seeing him play against us. It was crazy. Woke me up. That's when I really seen basketball. My first day of college workout. The next chapter in the legend of Pee Wee Belfield would also coincide with the hard luck story of an HBCU dream deferred. As Ramel's first season as a college athlete, was also the last of the 125-year history of St. Paul's College. There was none weak about St. Paul at all. It was survival. That's all there was. It was fun, though. In order to make it out there, you had to know what you was doing. You really did. When I first heard they were shutting it down, I thought it was a joke until the season was going real bad. And then it was one practice. It was just like, Y'all keep messing around. Y'all ain't gonna have nowhere to go next year. They already shut the school down. And that's when I was like, what, for real? I really didn't believe it until the summer, coming back into the, my sophomore year, when I really didn't have nowhere to go back to. So I was like, that's when I really got real, because I was thinking it was just rumors and stuff. But when I tried to um, go back, I ain't had nowhere to go back to. And I had a major balance and Transfit strips got locked up, all type of stuff. I just knew I wasn't able to get back into school. Do a, they got my transcripts on hold and I have an outstanding balance to pay. And I ain't know none of that because I was on a full scholarship when I first got there. But when it shut down, everything switched up. So I just was staying down hopefully and praying that something else would come through. And even as an athlete on a full scholarship, St. Paul said Ramel would have to pay a hefty fee to get his transcript released. And without those transcripts, he wouldn't be able to transfer to play at a new school. Pee Wee was left with no way to continue his career on the basketball court, but instead of giving up on his dreams, Pee Wee decided to move to Raleigh, North Carolina, get a job, stay in the gym, and wait to see if his transcripts would ever be released. So instead of scoring 20 on the court, he ended up making venties behind the counter at Starbucks. You know, I ain't really want no, no job anyway. I really wanted to just go back to school and hoop. So I just opened the phone book. The first thing I seen was Starbucks, and I called them, asked for an interview. They was fortunate enough to let me come in for an interview, and I put that I was a shooting guard on my resume, so I guess my manager had laughed so hard because that was a joke to him. And when he called me to schedule me up for the interview, he said, we need a shooting guard around here. And so, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Hey, that's a true story. Shout out him for always giving me that job because it won't for him, I don't know where I'd be. For real. And there's nothing wrong with serving coffee because Starbucks is a, it's a great chain, but that's not the career path that he really wanted. But he never gave up and he played basketball in Raleigh as opposed to running rapids because there's more talent in Raleigh. And he told me, he said, Dad, I'm not giving up. I said, no, son, don't give up because our faith in God uh, determines us not to give up. So we know that uh, with him, all things are possible. So uh, I have to say that God made a way, as he always does. I knew that life continued and life keep going. And if it was meant for me to play basketball, some way God would make a way for me to um, get back into school. So 
I just had to try to stay out of trouble, you know, keep it clean, clean mind, stay focused. But at the same time, I knew I had to had to maintain at life. And so I knew I wasn't, wasn't gonna be able to try to perfect my craft most, m much as I used to, cause I didn't know if I was gonna be back in school or not. So I didn't wanna just sit and waste my time when I could be like trying to get a job, make money and stuff like that. I can Im imagine in some moments, he always said, wow, you know, am I ever gonna get another chance? Am I ever gonna get another chance? But he never give up mentally, but sometimes his uh, uh, facial expression would look like he was a little down. So being the person I am, I always would encourage him. And I, I didn't give up because God didn't give up on me. I ain't never put all my tools into one basket, but at the time it was fun at that time because it kept me out of a lot of unnecessary trouble. You know what I'm saying? Because ain't no telling what I could get into at that time. Because at that time it was, you had to get it. You had to get it. Wasn't nobody giving you none. Wasn't nobody giving me none. You know what I'm saying? Nobody gonna help nobody when they don't think you're doing it for a good cause. So I couldn't tell them, yeah, I need help because I'm going to school. I, that job really just kept me focused. I hit the gym every now and then, probably like once a week, knowing they ain't halfway enough of what I should be doing, but just a little bit was more than enough for me because it was more mental than it was physical at that time anyway. And this game of mental versus physical one-on-one -on -one would last for the next three years. But with one phone call in the summer of 2015, Romel went from the Starbucks shooting guard to the 24-year-old junior six man of the Livingstone Blue Bears. I just know one day, this was one of the bad times of, of the summer, like one of the dark times, and Coach Simpson just called me and let me know that the transcripts had got released and if I was trying to come back to school, that they had a spot for me. And that was like the best news I heard in so long. Like I think I ain't even go back to work that day. I just was like, yeah, I'm hooping now. And after that, I turned a lot of stuff around from that phone call to that same day. I like molded, molded the whole rest of my future from that day to now, like from that one phone call. And from that one phone call, I don't know how my transcript got loose to this day. I ain't really asked no questions. You know what I'm saying? I know I had something to do with Coach Joyner. Rest in peace, Coach Joyner. And my assistant coach of St. Paul, his name is Coach Travis. They did something, and Coach, Coach Stinson just looked out. I'd like to thank Coach Dante Travis, because Coach Dante Travis also was assistant coach here uh, with the girls basketball. And he told me that uh, something that came through, that he could get his transcript. And when he got his transcript, he told uh, Coach Stinson about it. So Coach Stinson gave him a call. And Eric DeBose also came from uh, St. Paul's College, but he, was, he had came here and he had gotten a chance uh, prior to Romel getting here. So Eric was, was and uh, Romel are great friends even now. And uh, Eric was playing here, so Eric kind of, you know, showed him around, chaperoned around him or what or not. But, but the three years out, Romel got more mature. So he's not your average 19 year old, 18 year old coming out of high school. And now Romel's up in his 20s. So he's, he's more mature, but he's young at heart. And just like any good legend, sometimes the facts seem stranger than fiction. And after going from high school phenom to being one of the final St. Paul Tigers to serving coffee for three years waiting on a clerical miracle, Ramel Pee Wee Belfield was back hooping. And in his first 18 minutes of play in more than two years, in one of the most prestigious arenas in the game, Pee Wee led the Blue Bears with 14 points against none other than their defending NCAA champion Duke Blue Devils on their home court in Cameron Indoor Stadium. He came back impressively. He was inside of Cameron Indoor Stadium. And of course, uh, Duke was doing their thing. That was the year when they had um, Brandon Ingram. Brandon Ingram was there doing his thing, uh, Thornton, as well as a few others that had Duke. But I had never been inside Cameron Indoor Stadium. And to go in Cameron Indoor Stadium and, and I didn't have to pay, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 forget about it. Man. That speaks volume for itself. But let alone when he got in the game and he began to exercise his skill, he always played in the team format. He's never been a one man, uh, you know, shoot first. He always passed first interior because that's what his coaches always instilled in him and he loved the game. But to, to play at a high level and play in a, a Division I team, in fact, they were defending champions that year, the NCAA. He had scored 14 points, you know. There was a lopsided victory for Duke, but it was a, it was a, 
a milestone. And then to see my son to excel, to play against some tough competition, uh, I was excited. Overjoyed. I you know the first game back, we had to play Duke. So if I was in shape or not in shape, we had to play Duke. You know, if I won't ready, you had to get ready. But I think I was more than ready mentally. The physical part took a little, little extra seconds for me to get right. It came though. Know, the 14. You know what I'm saying? I really talk about it, but that was 14 points on Duke first game back in two years. That was tough. That was tough. I wasn't nervous. Not at all. I wanted to win, but that was a long process. Long process. Just a humbling experience for somebody that could, like, you know, could have done anything before I came back to school to, to alter me even coming back to school. The fact that I just was patient and just believed in the man above that one day I'd be back playing ball, it really came, the story really came back to me. Now, if this legend were a Hollywood movie, this is the point in the story where both the tears and the credits would roll. But after his stellar return against Duke, Pee Wee still had two full seasons of basketball left to play. But this more mature version of Pee Wee Belfield wasn't back in the game to regain the phenom status he once had. He was back out of pure love of the game. And over the course of his career at Livingstone College, he's been everything from a starter in a CIAA championship game, to coming off the bench as a shooting specialist, to being a leader and protector of a brotherhood that he worked hard to be a part of. Each of my brother, in their own way, they got their own different type of love for each one of them. All of them. With them guys, I go to war with them guys. I don't like nobody messing with them either. Like, if I don't say that they doing too much, I don't like nobody to tell them they wildin' or nothing like that. So if they good with me, then they should be good with everybody. That's how I feel with them, that's how I care with them. I care all of them like my little brother, you know what I'm mean? saying? I'm real protective over them guys. And they, they like that over me too. Since the first day, you know what I'm saying, I gave them the real me. So it's not nothing different. I'm doing the same thing I've been doing every day since the first day. So if you do it your all, then you're gonna only be satisfied with the best you can do. So I just, you know, every day, live it like it's my last from the get-go. He's a senior and he's scheduled to graduate in June with a business administration degree. So that's first and foremost, That that is the ultimate goal to graduate, uh, to have a degree, and to pursue his career uh, further after uh, Livingstone. But I'm still grateful that Livingstone gave him a chance. And uh, it's a wonderful school. It's gonna be a bittersweet. But prayerfully, my prayers is that they win it all. And that he, he, he might be the MVP of the tournament. That's what the ultimate goal is. But ultimately, I just want him to play uh, uh, and have a, a great time to enjoy it. And it's something that his, 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 his my grandchildren, his children, can't, can't remember and say that you know, my father participated uh, in this at, at a high level, I might add. You can't hide your emotions, you know? You know what I'm saying? So everything you try to hide behind during the season, it comes out at the attorney. So if you're a dog, you're gonna be a dog. If you, if you pretend to be a dog, you can show up the biggest cat in that arena. So I'm ready to see what them dogs are. And even though his last hurrah in the 2018 CIAA tournament didn't end with Pee Wee cutting down the nets in the Spectrum Center, his tough play helped his team reach the quarterfinal round, losing a close game to the reigning tourney champ. And the legend of Pee Wee Belfield may have reached mythological status with this amazing putback dunk that may have very well been the jam of the tournament, as well as the latest and possibly greatest moment in the legend of Pee Wee Belfield.
I think a lot of Florida State fans are excited about the type of offense uh, that you run. Talking about the Gulf Coast offense, I am. huh? Uh, Joey, you know about the Gulf Coast offense, huh? No. It originated at Florida AM and m University. Still on his feet, and he's breaking toward the goal line. He is going to score. Six points, touchdown, Florida AM. m They made it look easy. How would I describe it? Lethal simplicity. It consists of spreading the football horizontally, vertically, as much as possible, as quick as possible. Something's burning up in here. Son, you've been toast. It's just that easy. Wide open for six. We want to score fast and off. And the Rattlers want to score early. They want to score fast. Willie Taggart is a, is a good guy, man. Good guy, good person, good program. But the golf goes offense belongs to Florida AM and m and was originated by uh, Coach Billy Joe, his staff. So they can call it the golf something, but uh, I would prefer them not use golf post office being that we had a period in the 90s and early 2000s where it became nationally known for its passing yards and offense in general. And the Rattlers are off and going. They have made it look easy on one of the best defensive teams in Division I AA. Hanna rolls out to his left, sets up, looks downfield, a strike. And it lands. They made it look easy. The one thing they had to do was stop the pass, the air attack of the FAMU Rattlers. Wide open for six. And you've got to give credit where credit is due. That was a perfect pass. 25, Coming out of high school, I originally committed to Florida State. But I didn't get a chance to go over to FAMU while I was there. Uh, Coach Billy Joe was in contact with me the entire time. And, you know, once it was time to make a change from Temple, you know, that's the first person I thought about. We didn't do very well playing in a really, really tough Big East against the likes of Virginia Tech and West Virginia, uh, Miami. Pat Bonner, he'll get the start. He's primarily a drop back passer. He'll try to spread the ball vertically against the Miami secondary. He stands tall in the pocket. Here's Pat Bonner. He'll get most of the snaps today, according to Coach Dickerson. He's from this area. A little myth that Miami did not recruit him. He wound up going to Temple. We're here with uh, Deborah Coleman, who is Pat Bonner's mom, who went to Boyd Anderson High School. And uh, you were a little bit vocal this week about schools backing off him and recruiting. But are you living and dying with every play up here? Yes, I am. I really am. But I'm still proud of my children. Very proud. Bonner will go from the shotgun. They have, this has been a long march they've had. They started at their own six-yard line. There are flags down. He throws under pressure. And it is intercepted. Last year, Miami won by 31 over the Owls. And this year, Butch Davis's club wins by 32. Along with playing Penn State, who's in the top five every year. Pat Bonner on a quarterback. Bonner on a deep drop. Intercepted on the play. Nittany Lions go to 2-0. Temple 0-3. We had a coaching change. Uh, Coach Ron Dickerson, who recruited me, was fired. And they brought in Bobby Wallace who wanted to put in an op option type offense. I can run and get you a couple yards, but I wasn't with running the option and getting hit and licked and beat all up when I know my chance at, you know, fulfilling my dream of even touching the NFL football field was to be able to throw the ball. So my mom and I, we did some research along with my high school coach and uh, we gave Coach Billy a call. He recruited me, even though he knew, you know, he may not have had a chance at that time, he still recruited me like he had a chance at it. And that stayed with me throughout my, my college time, times where it wasn't going right at Temple. That was, that was in my head. But my mom, you know, bless her soul, she said, you know, this is the decision you made, this is what you stick with. And he said, you know, nothing would be etched in stone. You know, he knew who I was, he knew my talent. Uh, but old team and Samson would be graduating. So the job would be wide open to whomever was there through summer training. You know, I just told myself to get in the shape first, you know, while I'm learning the offense. And I had some good days in, in the summer. Jose had some good days in the summer. Mike had some good days. And uh, what Coach Billy said that, he said, you know, I'm going to start each one of you in a game of peace, going by the time you got here. Mike being there the longest, he got that start against Hampton. Bam, you opened the 98 campaign at home against Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference defending champion Hampton. The Rattlers were seeking revenge from last year's 18-15 loss to the Pirates, but Hampton brought a veteran team to Tallahassee. Coupled with Coach Billy Joe's search for a starting quarterback, 
the Pirates escaped with a 21-14 win. It would be the Rattlers' only loss of the regular season. So the second game, it was Jose's turn because he came in before me. Uh, we scored 84 points, but 21 of those points were also mine. The Hampton loss would not be a predictor for the rest of the season as the Rattlers hit the road and rocked Norfolk State 84 to 14. After Mike Moran's start against Hampton, Jose Loriana got the start against the Spartans as the search for a starting quarterback continues. Loriana laid his claim by leading the Rattlers in a rout. The third game was mine, of course and I had a 30 for 35 performance with 345 yards, three touchdowns. And I think uh, we pretty much knew, you know, that, that that performance did it against a better opponent than the week before. I was nervous. I was actually excited, uh, being that I only played in pieces of those first two games. And it was more so just to show that, listen, this race wasn't really close. You know, I'm here to go ahead and supplant myself as a starter so that we can really get in tune and go ahead and win some ball games. So coming out, the beauty of it to me was to look up and see 50,000 people that look like me. You know, I played in front of 100,000 at Penn State, but it's nothing like two bands going back and forth. A little trash talking and just the environment was different. It was fun. Week three took the Rattlers to Mississippi Memorial Stadium to take on the Tigers of Jackson State. It was a matchup of two perennial black college football powers, but on this night, they were no match as Pat Bonner guided the Rattlers to a 45-7 taming of the Tigers and laid his claim to the starting quarterback spot. Bonner's performance earned him the starting spot for the rest of the season. Little did we know he would become the Mad Bomber. We can run one play, but that particular play can have six different results. You know, a lot of times in, in pro football, they run what you call option routes, choice routes. Well, we were doing that 20 years ago at the college level. Hence why Jaquay Nunley was always open. Jaquay Nunley will be in the end zone all by himself. Another great run after catch, Jaquay Nunley, one of the rack boys. Kane Lamb was always open because of these choice routes. Kanan Lamb, six points, touchdown Florida and m They made it look easy. Lamb chop, hands, softest pair of hands you ever see. But he also played opposite of Jaquay, same spot, opposite side. And with those two running those routes, like I said, I watched him throw a football up, look at it, and turn his head back and catch it over and over. That tells you his hand-eye coordination to go along with being smart enough to know where to go and when to go there on a route. And they have it complete to Kanan Lamb. He has the reception still on his feet, and he's breaking toward the goal line. He is going to score. Kanan Lamb with a great run after catch. And again, a nice run after catch. One of the rack boys. Demetrius Bendros stretched the field for us a lot. Going the home run ball for Bendros. Touchdown, fam, you. Demetrius Bendros gets the touchdown. Three Kain, 15 touchdowns. Looking into the end zone. Has it. Touchdown. Florida and m Was open because of these routes. Cedric Mitchell, who was the fourth of our receivers but still had 50 catches, was open because of these choice routes. So if you're spreading the field vertically and horizontally at different levels, the defense can't keep up with those corridors. It's almost impossible. I told you exactly what they do so well. Once they catch the ball, it's what they do after they catch the ball. Watch Kane and Lamb get away. Ah, oh, you think you got me? No, you don't. That's what a rack boy is, run after catch. I want to say that name was there before I got there. But I think because we had so many games that caught the eye of the nation, it became a household name. 25, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, family. Something's burning up in here. Son, you've been toast. It's just that easy. A&T was homecoming. They caught us. <laughs> A&T caught us at a bad time. You know, we were rolling. They came down and we put some on them, 51-12. Uh, I had four 35 and five touchdowns. The Aggies of North Carolina A&T and highly touted running back Michael Bass Knight came to the Rattlers' den for homecoming and left with little bite as the Rattlers rolled 51-12. Like I said, I'm a competitor, and uh, Ted had been in the MEAC and black college football as a starter, you know, for three years at that point, I think. 
and he had done some great things. But a reporter asked me, we didn't ask me, he pretty much told me that this was the, the best in black college football. And I said, well, have you, have you watched us yet? And that was the fire I needed. And I told, you know, my team, you know, this, this is the night that we'll never let people forget. And they were on board. They read the comments that were coming out of Washington, D.C. And me and Ted, we laughed about it afterwards. But I told him, I said, the worst thing that guy could have did was told me you were the best playing right now, and I'm standing here. So 502 yards, seven touchdowns later, I, I think he gave me a nod for that. The Rattlers' first trip to Jacksonville's Altel Stadium showcased the two top quarterbacks in the MEAC, Howard's Ted White and FAMU's Pat Bonner. When the air show was over, the Rattlers emerged victorious 69-41 to as Pat Bonner rolled up the numbers, so did the Rack Boys, whose run after catch style also led the conference and the nation. Jaquay Nunley, Kanan Lamb, Tariq Kahim, and Cedric Mitchell gave opposing defenses the Blues all season long. I tell you what, and they have made it look easy on one of the best defensive teams in Division I AA. The Morgan State Bears were up next, and this time they weren't the bad news Bears of old. Morgan State came to Tallahassee with upset on their minds and made a game of it before the Rattlers rolled on to a 59-32 win. The victory put the Rattlers at 7-1 and, and heading to Baton Rouge to meet the Southern Jaguars. Anytime you score nearly 60 points a game, you can score fast and you can score often. And if FAMU gets ahead of you, chances are you won't get it. Southern was anxiously awaiting the arrival of the Rattlers. The Jaguars were embarrassed the year before in Tallahassee for homecoming, 33-3 in fact. It was their only loss all season. Southern would force the Rattlers into an old-fashioned shootout, but made the final mistake of giving FAMU the ball with less than two minutes to play in the game. Bonner and the Rattler offense would execute to perfection, taking the game down to the last 11 seconds before claiming victory. For the second consecutive year, Southern is stunned by the Rattlers, 50-48. One thing they had to do was stop the pass, the air attack of the FAMU Rattlers. The season finale would be a big one with over 66,000 fans in the Florida Citrus Bowl. The Florida Classic was the biggest ever as FAMU and Bethune-Cookman came to Orlando riding high. BCC's only conference loss was to Howard, whom the Rattlers beat, but Bethune beat Hampton, who handed FAMU its only loss. Both teams were fighting for a shot at the Division I AA playoffs, and BCC had its best team in over 20 years. The Wildcats started strong as quarterback Patel Troutman led them to early scores, but the Mad Bomber was undaunted as Pat Bonner picked the Wildcats secondary apart like a scud missile. And the FAMU faithful were ecstatic as the Rattlers closed the regular season with the bang, 50-14. Coach Joe knew a big win in the regular season's final game against rival Bethune-Cookman would land the Rattlers in the Division I AA playoffs and even give FAMU a shot at hosting a playoff game. The NCAA did not disappoint, announcing that the Rattlers would host Troy State in Bragg Memorial Stadium on November 28th. The Rattlers were up to the task and avenged a 1996 playoff loss by toppling the Trojans 27-17. The announced attendance of over 16,000 fans was the largest of all playoff games during the first round and had Rattler fans calling for more. It was not to be, and FAMU would play round two in the Midwest. I think the toughest game uh, that entire year had to be that, that playoff game that we lost because we dominated these people from start to finish and we, we just didn't make the plays we usually make. Uh, some other things going to that, I don't know if I should share it, but, uh, you know, when you're, you're HBCU and you have 20,000 at a first round playoff game right. and you're ranked number four in the country, right. you're probably not supposed to be on the road right. in 30 degree weather. So I can say that 20 years later <laughs> that I don't think that was fair. Right. That was the toughest one that year. <laughs>
Two games from the ultimate goal of the Division I AA National Championship, FAMU flew to Macomb, Illinois to meet the Leathernecks of Western Illinois. Western, the Gateway Conference champions, had the top defense in Division I AA and would test it against the top offense of FAMU. Rattler fans came from everywhere to help cheer on the team, and FAMU took an early lead and held on until the second half when the Leatherneck running game got going. The Rattlers mounted a late comeback attempt to try and force the game into overtime, but an onside kick attempt failed and Western Illinois held on and advanced to round three. FAMU fell 24 to 21, and a great run had come to an end. The Rattlers finished the 1998 campaign 11 and two overall and 10 and one during the regular season. Just two games short, of a 20-year reunion with eventual Division I AA national champion, Massachusetts. Still, the Rattlers were rewarded for fielding the most prolific offense in the nation with three first-team All-Americas in quarterback Pat Bonner, wide receiver Jaquay Nunnally, and place kicker Juan Toro, the school's all-time leading scorer. It was a season that brought sellout crowds, outstanding media coverage, and memories of seasons past. In the annals of Rattler football, 1998 was truly sensational. I was blessed enough to be picked up by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as an undrafted free agent. Went down and I had a really, really good camp, I think. Um, you know, reading some of the articles and some of the, the media outlets. It was a situation where our quarterback room was young. We had Trent Dilfer, Sean King, and myself. So they were looking for someone older to bring in and it so happens that's what they end up doing. I spoke with Coach Dungey. You know, he said, listen, you know, it's not my call. You know, you had a great summer, great camp, and anything that I could do for you, I'll do. Which he did end up doing, he made a phone call uh, during the NFL Europe draft, and uh, Barcelona picked me up. And I went over there and uh, played a little bit, still didn't play as much as I, I wanted to. Uh, got an opportunity over in Canada, Winnipeg, uh, Blue Bombers had the rights to their draft. It was just, it was cold. <laughs> it was really, really cold. And uh, I came back, and I just said to myself, you know, I don't want to be a guy that's going to continue to bounce around and, you know, not put my all into it. So I said, you know what, well, let me go ahead and, and start doing some coaching. And it's exciting because the kids are excited. And I, don't, I haven't gone, I ain't too deep with them when it comes to the Gulf Coast offense, but they know it's my baby. And they work hard, and they're catching on to it. And I told them, you know, if you, you pay attention to detail and you hold each other, you know, responsible for what you're supposed to be doing and we're going to be successful. I've been running this same offense uh, since I started coaching back in 2005. And I uh, down in Florida at my high school, Board Anderson, at Lauderdale Lakes. Each one of my quarterbacks uh, went on to play college football with a couple of them playing at HBCUs. You can look them up. Herbert Bynes uh, went off to Hampton. Uh, Greg Hankerson went off to Norfolk State. Dane James played at Florida a and Virginia Union. Uh, Kenny Graham played at Virginia Union. Jackie Wilson played at Bethune Cookman. And Roosevelt Kaiser played at FAMU. So I coached all those guys as quarterbacks at my high school coming out of my playing days. So I know it can be successful. And all those guys went on HBCUs, as you see. So they had offers from mid-major Division I schools. But uh, 
I guess at that point in time, I had so much influence, being that it was still new to everyone. Oh my God, this is what Coach Bonner did at Florida a and and he still got a chance. Um, today, I, I say the same thing. You know, it's free education. The social life will probably be the best you'll ever be around. And you play good football. So if, if you choose to go to an HBCU, that doesn't mean that you're, you're shortening or lessening your opportunity. You're actually, actually adding to it because you're gonna take away an experience from an HBCU that you, you don't get from the, the, the larger school. You know, I, I went to a large school, so I understand the dynamics of both of them. Coach Billy Joel, he's a big one on detail and accountability. And if you heard me today, I still use those words just like he does because that's what that's what we heard throughout practice. Take your drop case on, eyes up, throw. Good shot. Get back. Turn your head. There you go. Automatic what? Backside, Ricardo. Automatic curl. Go. Going forward and we need it. Sit down. Turn and get out of there. Put it right on it. Good shot. Get better. Detail. Detail. As a person, I to this day call him when I have questions about something, whether it be life, whether it be sports. Uh, he was a father figure for all of us. You know, he could be the mean person at one point and then call you in office and give you a hug and I'll say, get out. So uh, he, he means a lot to me, means a lot to a bunch of us. And I'm looking forward to seeing him. On the 22nd, they play Savannah State in Tallahassee and our team is gonna be recognized uh, for our 20 year HBCU National Championship, which they're inviting all of us down, which is a pretty neat thing. So you'll have, we got 50 some confirmed now, that'll be there out of 91 of us. Of course, we had a couple that's still not with us, but we'll make sure to, to make sure they're there somehow. One thing they had to do was stop the pass, the air attack of the FAMU Rattlers, and the Rattlers are off and going. Bonner rolls out to his left, sets up, looks downfield, a strike. They want to score early, they want to score fast. And you've got to give credit where credit is due. That was a perfect pass. Something's burning up in here. Son, you've been toast. It's just that easy. It's been on his feet, and he's breaking toward the goal line. He is going to score. Kanan Lamb with a great run after catch. That's what a rat boy is, run after catch. Wide open for six. I tell you what, and they have made it look easy on one of the best defensive teams in Division I AA. And Jaquay Nunley will be in the end zone all by himself. Looking into the end zone, Lamb has it, touchdown. Florida and m Kanan Lamb, six points, touchdown Florida and m They made it look easy. 25, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Fan The name Tariq Cohen means a lot of things, depending on where you know him from. For the casual sports fan, he's a back-flipping viral sensation. For opponents, he's a headache and a human blur. For North Carolina a and supporters, he's already a legend. But to his family, he's much more than that. He's a comedian, and he could be, if football doesn't make it, he would be a Kevin Hart or something like that. I'm going to wrap up my mind. I'm going to wrap up the disaster master. I'm going to wrap up the disaster master. Stop losing this. Stop losing this. Never mind. You can't get this. I'm in charge. This is on me. And I took that to school. I was wrapping up against him. I'm big on my relationship with my mom. Because she's been there for me when nobody else was. Because she raised me and my brothers, three boys, all by herself. Good job, and we're all doing well, we're all alive. Kudos to her. We had to make things work when things weren't there for us. She would take less, so we have more. But he was at 2005 for the Raiders, little rec league team. He wasn't even on a money back then. I think he was on defense. They loved that football. I think my love for sports is just seeing the growth that I had. My first year, I was all right. And then my second rec league year, I was just garbage. I played D-line, wasn't receiving the ball, didn't play no type of offense. I wasn't getting much playing time. High school, finally started playing offense. And I was getting uh, all-around player. 
He likes the contact sport, not physical. Always running and ripping. You know he has a twin. Well, listen, well, I've been through it. <laughs> the doctors, I mean, they ain't good though. Tough little thing. He real tough. And Tariq lost his tooth, chipped his tooth. Them and his little twin brother, they playing. He laying in his mouth or something. Y'all get I told them funny. about how you hit Tariq in the mouth. That was funny. He chipped his tooth, hit you in the mouth or something. It's a bike pump. A bike pump. Ain't that? <laughs> it came apart. Bike pump. Wait, 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 wait. I was just swinging yeah. on the bike. That was like we were playing tag. We were playing tag and I, it was swinging in a circle and I was trying to like get close. Playing basketball one day, having a little dunk contest. Guess he thought he was Spider-Man. He hanged from the rim. <laughs> <laughs> he was straight on his head. Straight on his head. Big one. Oh, he didn't play no more that day. You know what I'm we was competing with uh, these other twins we knew. Yeah. And they was doing backflips like off of each other's backs and stuff. So we was like, man, we got to get something popping. Rest in peace to one of them. her great friends. His name was um, Trey. And um, he taught Tariq and Tarbell how to do those backflips. So he started off with dad, then he went outside in the yard over the porches and everything like that. He took all that creativity mixed around with football like that, so he, he does special stuff. I mean, only Tariq can do what Tariq do. The coach was like, all right, we want to start, and he a freshman. He started since his freshman year. Like, after the third game, he's been, oh. A foot race, the call will not lose. 83 yards. Three. Welcome to the Tariq Cohen Show. Watching Tariq Cohen run around and over opponents at North Carolina A&T, you'd think he did the same thing at Bunn High School. Well, not at first. I played JV my first two years, and then... Sophomore year, after the JV season's over, I got moved up for the playoffs. First, I was scared of having the ball in my hand because I, I didn't want to forget the plays on offense. It was on a special teams where I first started having the ball in my hand, and I scored a kick return. My teammate had pitched the ball back to me, and I scored a kick return, and I just fell in love with making touchdowns. I was shining on JV. I was getting all my yards on JV. And then when I got moved up to uh, varsity, you know, we had a squad on varsity. So I just played my role respectively, and I just did a uh, punt return and kick return. So. I had caught some good punt returns, but I got smacked one punt return, like the first playoff game. It was kind of like my welcome to varsity hit. Every time we played the rival schools, like um, Lewisburg High School with Franklin, he always is the main attention. He'll get that ball somehow, and he's just gone. It's like nobody can stop him. Not only was Tariq showing promise running the ball on the gridiron, he also showcased his trademark speed as a standout on the Bun High track team. Track was fun. My freshman year, I ran track. And then I quit because I hated practicing for track. I hate running for no purpose. But then it came back my sophomore year and ran track. In my junior year, we went to state. We uh, qualified in the 4x2. We got second place in the 4x2. Senior year, you know, I really took track seriously. Had a coach Howell. He coached us through track, you know, made it all the way to state. And I got second at state in the 100. And then our 4x1 team got first in, uh, in the state. Despite his success on the track, it didn't take Tariq long to realize that the best use of his talents was on the football field with the ball in his hands. Junior year is where I really uh, found myself and found like that I wanted to be an offensive player mainly and really came to run the ball. Play played slot too, but we really ran a spread offense and ran a lot of zone, so that was opening it up and that's how I got most of my yards. He followed up a solid junior campaign with a spectacular senior season, rushing for over 1,500 yards. Despite those impressive stats, Cohen struggled to attract colleges. And to some of those schools, he wasn't even considered the best player on the team. In terms of recruitment, I thought it was going good because I had some great receivers on the outside, like Jonathan Austin, plays at NC State right now, bringing all the scouts in. So I'm taking it like he's bringing them to the team, not just himself, he's bringing it for all of us. So when they come to the games, you know, we're showing out. we all making plays. We feel like we all go to the same school. But that's not necessarily how it always goes down, you know. They chose him, and he went to State, and then I wasn't getting a lot of looks, like, offer-wise. I was getting a couple looks from other uh, not as big schools, but the only school to really give me an offer was Antique, and then that's why I took that and ran with that. I thought it would have been more schools than that that would offer for them, but it's the love and support that they were giving them down there. I mean, a lot of people in all the schools, 
fixated a bunch of weeks. Enter North Carolina A&T. Coach Rod Broadway was looking to rebuild the struggling program, and he made the trip to Bun to see the dynamic running back. But he took the scenic route. The first thing he told me was uh, that he had wasted like an hour of his trip because he had went to Dunn instead of Bun. Once he made it to Cohen, he didn't promise him a pie in the sky. In fact, he didn't promise him much at all. He was telling me how I wasn't going to be an every down back and that he wanted to use his special teams and throw me the ball and stuff like that. And that, that was just fueling me even more to come to Antique and make plays. My teammates used to go to the, the G Ho down there. You know, that's well known everywhere. And we had some advisors here that also went to uh, HBCUs, and they used to always tell us and take us on even uh, take us on trips to HBCUs around here. I'm just like wowed about the whole situation because to see my child running up and down the field, touchdown after touchdown, get up off me. Uh, uh, I mean, you know. <laughs> we used to come together here and just ball out, light that scoreboard up. We just had so much fun while we played here. As a freshman at North Carolina A&T, Tariq Cohen bolted out of the gates, rushing for over 1,100 yards and eight scores. But he still remembers the feeling of his first few carries in front of the 24,000 crazed Appalachian State Mountaineer fans at Kid Brewer Stadium in Boone, North Carolina. I just remember it was so many people at that game. That's, that's the biggest game I ever played in. The crowds was just like this side of the stadium would be yelling out. And the other side of the state, I'm going to be yelling state. It was just the most people. And then the elevation. Also, it was my first time playing on turf. It was my first college game ever. First carries. First time seeing those college athletes, you know. I only had three carries for like six yards. But uh, it felt good being out there. A fellow running back that, uh, that was the starter, Dominique Drake, he really coached me up and brought me into the college life and how to adjust to the speed of the game at that level. I just took it from there. When he got hurt one game, I filled in for him and then had a great game against Hampton. And that just really gave me the confidence to know that I can play with these guys on this level. And I do have the athleticism and skills to be able to compete at a high level here. Just because you're a freshman doesn't mean you can't play. I came in as a freshman, I had the same mentality that I wasn't going to play. And when I, while I had that mentality, I wasn't playing. But as soon as I felt like I could do it and I had the confidence, that's when I started playing and that's when I started making plays. Speaking with freshman Tariq Cohen, Tariq, 299 yards, 191 rushing, 119 receiving. Just talk about your impact of being a freshman on this team. When I came to the team, that I wanted to be a playmaker and I wanted to make plays for my team, put us in a position to win. To say that he played at a high level at AT is a bit of an understatement. As Tariq went into his senior year, he needed just over 600 yards to become the MIAC Conference all time leading rusher. But at AT, under head coach Rod Broadway, there's no room for complacency, and they knew coming into the 2016 season that all eyes were on the Aggie backfield. Coach Broadway always tells us that uh, the target's on our back and that we can't stay the same, we can't be complacent. So whatever we did last year, we always amp it up. Like right now, our off-season workouts are crazy right now. What we did last year was hard compared to the year before that, and we made it to the Celebration Bowl, but we still didn't get all the goals that we wanted to meet. So this year, our work ethic and our workouts have been extremely hard and it's gonna put us in the right place for this season coming up. The bullseye on the back of the 2016 Aggies came largely in part to Tariq's show-stopping performance in the 2015 Air Force Reserve Celebration Bowl, where he racked up 295 yards and three touchdowns en route to an HBCU National Championship. Really all the people here in Bun really supported me behind that game. And before the game, I just got a lot of notifications like, we're watching you, we're behind you and let's go Tariq and all those. And that really drove me. When I had made that run, Twitter was going crazy. My people from Bun, when I got out of the game, I checked those tweets and I was loving it. It was just a good confidence building game and to know that I still have my people behind me. Moving forward, Tariq looks to once again take his game to the next level as he hopes to hear his name called in the 2017 NFL Draft. But as he's already learned, he has to elevate his game and take on new responsibilities to make a name for himself in the big leagues. Solidify myself, I think I, need, I do need to get a special team. And uh, I work on that every day since my freshman year in practice. You know, at the beginning of the practice, we go out there, we catch punts, we catch kick returns. I believe that uh, my height will be a setback, but it's nothing I haven't heard before. I've heard I'm short before, I heard 
that I'm small in stature and that I can't take the workload of typical running back, but numbers don't lie. And I feel like that's the only reason you, you could overlook me is because of my size. So I just factored into the player I am and I let that fuel my fire. Everyone has their doubts. You know, you may doubt yourself sometimes, but keep going, let that fuel you. And even when you doubt about other people, let that also fuel your fire. Like, have a motivation. I just continue to prove the doubt is wrong. That's what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to getting to that stage. Just looking for a team to invite me to their camp and just show them what I made of. Right after the season ended, I was working out with a guy by the name of Natron Means, who played in the NFL and also is a coach down in Winston-Salem State. So I was traveling to Winston, working out, just getting getting some pro tips and advice on, on the next level. I had talked to a former player, Javon Hargrave. He played at South Carolina State. He now plays for the Steelers. And I was asking him a lot of questions, like when did the invites go out and stuff like that. So then he told me early January. So when January came around, I was real nervous. I was pressing. I kept uh, following up on if anybody got an invite to the combine. And then I was driving to Raleigh from Durham one day, coming from Durham Mall, and uh, I got an email from NFL Combine, and then I just turned up in the car. I just turned the music all the way down. And I was just yelling the whole way home. Called my, uh, called one of my cousins, and I called my coach and just broke the news to them, and it was just, it was pandemonium. And the combine was stressful at first, because uh, the first day I got there in Indianapolis, we was in the hospital for six hours. Just getting physicals and stuff, you know, MRIs, x-rays. Then it got fun but once we started getting all the free stuff and started getting uh, into the drills and stuff like that broad jump, bench press, and a 40-yard dash, that didn't start getting fun. And my mentality was not to be the worst in anything I did, because, you know, I come from, I arguably come from one of the uh, smallest schools at the combine, so I didn't want that to reflect my performance. So when I ran my 40, I didn't want to be the slowest person running the 40. When I did my bench press, I didn't want to be the, the weakest person doing the bench press. Did better than a whole bunch of people in the 40. I ran a 4-4-2, 30 fast out of running backs, and then my bench press was not the lowest. There was some other kids that was uh, way more than me, and bit, was bigger than me in stature, but didn't get it as many times as I did. After a strong showing at the NFL Combine, Tariq braced himself for what would be the biggest day of his life. The only problem, he didn't know which day it would be. On that Thursday, I really figured that I wasn't getting drafted in the first or second round, so I was watching the draft, but I was just watching it for uh, recreation. And uh, that Friday, we had a press box party. It was small, not too many people, because uh, my agent had said it was a slight chance that I might be drafted in the third round. So I was getting a little nervous because I really didn't want to be drafted in the third round because my family wasn't here, so they wouldn't have been here to witness it. But uh, luckily, I didn't get drafted in that third round, and uh, I didn't get any sleep that night. And then everything started falling into place. So that Saturday, you know, we had a big draft party here on campus. I was joking around to try to take the pressure off myself, try to take the stress out of the situation. So I kept picking up my phone, acting like I was getting a call, and just messing with everybody in the crowd. So when I did get the call, though, it was, it was a wonderful moment, I would like to say. Probably the best moment of my life so far. All the students that was with me there and my family, we, you know, we was live. Even before hearing his name called as the fourth round draft pick for the Chicago Bears, Tariq knew that Chicago was a place he was comfortable calling home. They had came to Pro Day. A day before Pro Day, he sent a scout out to meet with me. He was also from HBCU, so we really hit it off. He felt like I could be a tremendous asset to the team. And then uh, they seen me do well at Pro Day. And after Pro Day, they had invited me to the, the facilities to get a visit. Uh, really went well there, you know, met with all the coaches. And I wasn't just getting along with the offensive coaches, I was getting along with the defense coaches as well. So I could tell they really liked me. Bears knew what they were doing, they were trying to keep it silent. You know, I met with John Fox and Ryan Pace, the head coach and GM, and uh, they really told me that they felt like I'd be a tremendous asset to the team. For the past four seasons, Tariq Cohen has electrified the city of Greensboro every fall. And the field at Aggie Stadium has been the stage for some of Tariq's most memorable performances. The yeah, homecoming touchdown was really, I would say, uh, one of my best memories here. When I had dove in the end zone, check with the ref, see if it was a touchdown. It was, I just turned around and just let the crowd, let the crowd feel my energy. And it's just a little bit more of that Cohen magic. 
So it was just live in the corner. I tell all the freshmen every time they come come in that if you want to score on homecoming, you want to do it on that far end zone corner because that's just where all the alumni and former players are going to be. If you score in there, I know they're going to turn you up. And much like the great HBCU players before him, Tariq's name will echo in the walkways of Aggie Stadium for years to come as he takes his talents beyond the yard. i like to thank everybody at ANT, you know, the students that came in with me four years ago, uh, students that see me play here, just the community in Greensboro overall, because uh, they really supported me. And uh, without their support, I don't think I'd be the player I am today. Uh, they wouldn't have made this experience how it was without them. And uh, I'd just like to thank everybody, the coaches, the faculty. It just really, really made my four years worthwhile, and I'm, I'm glad I chose HBCU. Step foot on HBCU campus, it was just an amazing feeling. You know, you can relate to so many people here, and it's just like an automatic family. You automatically initiate to a family once you get here. So the saying Aggie Pride, it, it really, it's really more than just a saying. It's really a family bond. And uh, it's just been an amazing four years, and uh, I'm sad to see it go, but also happy to move forward. There's a pitch to Reed Cohen in the game. Tries a reverse field, gets away from Reed. Cohen sprinting! Oh boy, Tariq Cohen in Falcons territory! Second down and eight, they pitch it to Cohen, and he is sniffing in the end zone. And leaps into the end zone, and it is a touchdown for Cohen. Trubisky airs it out. Separation, looking for Cohen. He's got it! Tariq Cohen cutting to the outside. Cohen's got major speed. And Toss to Tariq Cohen. He's going to throw into the end zone. Touchdown, Zach Miller. Cohen from his own 40. Going the wrong way. Now he's really going the wrong way. Trying to reverse field. And look at this. He's got some blockers now. He was going the right way. Cohen all the way! Touchdown, Chicago! On second and nine, Cohen changes direction, comes to this side, and has some running room. Goes right around his man, down the sideline! 30! Cohen! 15! 10! 5! Touchdown! That means a lot, you know. It just shows the, uh, what the teammates think of me, you know, and that I'm really, like, you know, fitting in. Because that was my biggest worry coming into the NFL, you know. You've been with a team for four years in college, and then you're in a whole new setting. So to see that I'm fitting in well, you know, it means a lot. You're the one that does backflip catches, right? <laughs> yeah, I did that. <laughs> Hey, What's I'm, up Quinn. With you? I'm Quinn. Come on, we about to go to the huddle. Alright. Bears on three! Bears on three! One, two, three! Bears! Hello, boy, Bears! Yeah. Tariq. Yeah. Thanks, Tariq. Or Big, Big Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone has an ear for talent like I do. <laughs> you know, some people said I couldn't sing. I don't think they would listen to the right person. They probably heard Benny or Jordan, but my singing was excellent. <laughs> yeah, just taking pictures in the uh, frozen food section, you know. Holding the sausages instead of just looking at the camera. It's mainly my height, though. You know, I, I feel like that, that plays along with it, though. So they see me, and they know it's me automatically. Like, I was in the mall yesterday. I was in Woodfield Mall. And uh, people were just, you know, take, double laughing, double taking, just looking at me. Just automatically spotting me. They see a, a little grown man, you know. They, there's only one little grown man in Chicago right now. When you have a guy that's 4'9", you know, you, you worry about him sometimes. I feel bigger than everybody on the field. <laughs> Akeem said you were 4'9", though. Akeem is like 5'11", if I'm 4'9". <laughs> <laughs> so they allow you to be a DJ? Oh yeah, they know it. I got the best dance moves in here, so okay. they really don't got no choice. It's the tidiest I've seen so far, man. So keep up. Oh yeah, definitely. Doing your thing, man. If I knew you was coming, it would have been better. You know, I wouldn't have had the three-day-old spaghetti in here. <laughs> See, it's three days. He said he got it today. <laughs> Petroleum jelly on this meat. We got petroleum jelly, you know. Have y'all ever seen fried chicken on somebody's face? <laughs> 
chicken mm -hmm. We all did. <laughs> what you mean? Yeah. Time to go surprise the moms. My mom get on me about doing my own laundry. And I'm here doing somebody else's. There you go. I'm an expert. Oh. Woo! I mean, woo! <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> I want to give a special shout out from Todd and the Chicago Bears to all the mothers out there. Happy Mother's Day. And even though I couldn't make it to every household, you are appreciated. Thank you. Go Bears. I feel like I fit very well into the offense, you know. I'm doing a, a little bit of everything out here, outside receiver, in the slot, and in running back, and also special teams, so I feel like this is the offense for me. The role of being dynamic will be my biggest role, you know, being everywhere, uh, being the guy that uh, defense can't necessarily get the exact scheme upon, so then that will open up other guys. Just the fact that I'm everywhere in the offense, you know. I could be at running back one play, I could be at uh, slot receiver, and then uh, even at outside receiver. So I get to be out there a lot more during this time because they see what I can do at running back already. Uh, even though I'm still out there running back, you know, still uh, working on that also. It's just right now it's more receiver and uh, I'm just getting ready. I enjoy the challenge because I know it's, uh, you can make plays at a lot of different positions on the field and uh, the more positions I am, the more opportunity I have to make those plays. So if I'm at receiver, I can get a go ball or a screen from the receiver position. It's just different things that I can do. I just have this, uh, this attitude, like I don't, I don't feel like I've done anything yet. Uh, I, I wasn't in the Pro Bowl, uh, really not like a a definite household name yet, so I feel like I have a lot more to prove, you know. Didn't have any thousand yard season in any phase of the game, so I feel like I have a lot more to do. I'm still a running back. Yeah. Power back at it. <laughs> I gained some weight, so you know I'm even bigger than before, so I know y'all know that's like super big now. But yeah, so I feel like I'm ready. I'm 190. All muscle. Solid. or big school, uh, you can get the job done from anywhere, no matter how big you are. <clears throat> Sturdy, anybody.
The snap. The instantaneous start to every play in football. It's both simple in theory and complex in technique. And for one player on each roster, the snap is literally their only job. And that player is the long snapper. So when HBCU Game Day received an email from John Davis, the long snapper at North Carolina A&T, we asked him to give us the lowdown on the art of the long snap. My name is John Davis. I am from Chicago, Illinois. I'm a sophomore long snapper for North Carolina A&T. I grew up playing Pee Wee like anyone does, and the same situation with every long snapper. You get to a middle school team and they say they need one, so you just step up and say, hey, let me try this. And next thing I know, I'm doing it all throughout high school. I was originally committed to a school in Florida, but it didn't quite work out the way I was expecting it to. And by the grace of God, Coach Gibbs at A&T here came and called me up and said, we need a snapper right away. Can you start as a true freshman? I said, absolutely. So I packed my things, went straight to Greensboro, and the rest is history. A quick five months later, I have two rings, and I'm playing in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, winning a celebration bowl. Yeah! See, when people hear long snapper, they say, what? Who is that? And I say, just think about the guy who throws the ball to the punter or the guy who throws the ball to the holder. And they say, oh, you're the you're the hiker, the hiker. Oh, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's just, let's just say that, I'm the hiker. I learn just self-taught YouTube videos in middle school. My dad tells me, he's like, you know you can get scholarships for this? I was like, there's no way you can get scholarships, just a snap. And I looked into it and I started going to showcases and I got a... I got a long snapping trainer back at home, and he's piece by piece taught me every single little inch of long snapping, which many people don't realize there's a lot of parts to it, from the snap to the block to the keeping your mind completely clear, blocking out all the points, getting the ball right to that hunter's right hip, just perfect at the right speed they need it, at a perfect spiral is the most important part. Punt, there's a few more nerves because I have to run down the field after and it's a longer distance, but um, field goal, it can be pretty tough because that's right in the middle of the trenches, so there's all that talking and talking going on. And you have, that's when you have to block it out the most. Field goal is probably more pressure, but punt is more difficult um, skill-wise. Regular just getting ready in our ready position before we get down on the ball. And that's how we, uh, we look around when we get ready for uh, to monitor the field, see what linebackers are doing, see where the turner is at. And, uh, look between my legs, make sure my punter is ready. down in my stance, look straight back at my punter, Mackie, and that's all I think about is perfect snap, perfect snap, perfect snap every time. And then I just let the ball come out of my hands, and that's my job. It's, it's the best guys, but I think it's the best position in all of football, so I love the pressure. I love um, operating under pressure, it's just where I thrive. You need to have every snap be perfect or else you will get grilled by the fans. After my first game at Gardner-Webb my freshman year, I had a low snap which resulted in a blocked field goal and Coach Broadway gave me an earful about it and from that point on I just made sure I never had a bad snap ever again. And everywhere I went, um, no matter what kind of a and football gear I was wearing, no one knew exactly who I was at all because that means I'm doing my job. I mean, if I'm getting the ball back there and there's no mess ups, that means you're doing great. And such is the life of a long snapper. When you're good, Nobody has any idea that you even exist. But when you make a mistake, be prepared for the mobs and torches to try to chase you out of town. And with all the star power and success at North Carolina A&T, it's best if the long snapper remains tucked in the shadow of all their stars. The position itself is so overlooked and undervalued on the FCS level that the MEAC and SWAC don't even list long snappers on their conference awards list. I reached out to HBCU Game Day because I saw the SWAC and MEAC all conference lists, and then I saw that there were no long snapping positions on there. There was kicker and there was punter, but there was no long snapping, and I was like, that's strange. I guess the punter and the kicker just magically start off with the ball each play. And so I reached out because I have a lot of friends that go to other big schools, like in the SEC and the ACC, and they all have long snappers on their all conference lists. So I thought, maybe the SWAC and MEAC should start doing that. I think that'd be a great, great way to get them 
the recruiting game going more with the long snapping and the meek and swag um, because I like to see like to see my friends get the recognition that they deserve because it's a I mean our practices aren't that hard it doesn't seem hard but there's a lot to go into the long snapping an all conference long snapper has probably the same criteria that it would take to be a high school all-american long snapper which is actually a real thing believe it or not they focus on your spiral your speed getting the, the ball in the same spot 10 out of 10 times at the exact same speed um, getting down the field and making tackles and through your errors just like a baseball player you count their errors if they drop a, a pop fly if a snapper rolls one across the ground or shoots one over the punter's head that's not very good that's not a very good criteria you want to have your name on um, at the end of the day so any snappers that eliminate error and can get tackles down the field is a really good snapper and in a sport dominated by african americans at almost every position the long snapper is one of the few exceptions with even the predominant conferences of historically black colleges and universities only having 11 black long snappers at the 21 institutions of the MEAC and the SWAC. And for John Davis, he knows all too well the challenges of being an African-American kicking specialist. And he's zipping perfect spirals back in hopes that others like him might follow suit. Growing up, it was, it was a little rough because I go to these showcases for long snapping and there's no African-Americans there aside from myself. So I, I like to stand out when I go to things like that. So I just knew that if I could, if I could perform well at these camps and I could show uh, other African-American kids who maybe want to try long snapping, that it would give them that confidence because, you know, there's Marquette King, he's the only black punter in the NFL, so everybody knows about him. And specialist positions are primarily dominated by white people. And I think that'd be great if we could, uh, black people could break into this position field also. I remember I got this thing called Event Elite in high school, which is where you go down to IMG Academy with uh, Rubio Long Snapping, which is a really big name in recruiting for long snappers in high school. And I got this Event Elite status, which is the top 30 long snappers in the country um, coming out of high school. And my friend Ron was like, wow, it's actually pretty cool you got that. One of, being one of the very few African Americans to ever come out of high school as a top long snapper. And I was like, yeah, man, you can definitely do it too. I know you can, it'd be awesome. And next year he got it. He was one of the top elite long snappers in the country. And I believe that this is a breakthrough for us because um, I just loved, I just love long snapping as a whole and I love to see it as a diverse position like all the other positions. So I'm really hoping that the Miak and Swack will include this position in their all conference list so that we can get more African American long snappers in the mix also. to the question anymore.